Hello and welcome to the first session of our do-it-yourself 3D printer design workshop here at SimScale. Today we will start our journey through the world of engineering simulation and how to apply it for 3D printer design. And before we actually start to uh, dive into our today's topic, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clearly. Therefore, if you can hear me, please click the raise your hand button on the GoToWebinar control panel and I know that everybody can hear me loud. Perfect. Now it seems to work. Very nice. Okay. Just in the case for some reason uh, you would like to use your phone instead of your uh, microphone and headset of your computer, you can also use our toll-free audio service numbers uh, to directly connect to the audio stream of this webinar. Therefore, just dial one of these numbers according to the country you're living in and enter the access code 983 017878. All right, then let's take a look at our today's agenda. First of all, I would like to quickly introduce you to the idea of this workshop series. So, what will we do during the next three weeks? What will you learn? Uh, after that, we will talk a little bit about fundamentals. Our today's topic is extruder design. So today, I will show you how to use engineering simulation to optimize the design of your extruder and we will talk about you know the fundamentals of heat transfer but also about uh, uh, the working principle of FDM of uh, printers and so on. Just after that we will try to apply this knowledge during our live demo where we will show you how to set up such a simulation on your own and finally uh, we will discuss a homework assignment and we will have time for question and answers. Okay, now let's talk about this workshop series. So maybe first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Milot. I'm working here at SimScale for more than three years. And uh, I'm responsible for our academic program and workshop and webinar programs. And just to put in a nutshell, uh, why are we doing this webinars and what is this workshop and webinars about? Uh, we see that there's a big lack in the application of engineering. And we think that engineering simulation is a great technology that every engineer in the world should be able to use. And therefore, the, uh, this workshop is about give you very interesting insights about the fundamentals of engineering simulation and to show you uh, how to apply it and how to use yourself simulation. Um, we will focus very much on the application of engineering simulation for 3D printer design. Therefore, this course is very hand-on and we will not talk a lot about um, simulation theory or um, uh, detailed application of, of simulation for industrial projects, we'll really focus on hands-on stuff for 3D printer design for hobbyists. Finally, why are we doing this workshop? Uh, as I mentioned, we truly believe that engineering simulation should be a standard tool for every engineer. And with this workshop, we hope to introduce as many students, engineers, and designers as possible to our free SimScale cloud simulation platform. And for sure, we would love if you would leverage our free tools uh, to improve your own design projects and if you would contribute your simulation to our simulation library. All right, then a very important point. How does this workshop work exactly? Uh, you might uh, took a look at our, our website and the idea of this workshop is that we will discuss every week, we have three sessions, every week one session, every session we will discuss a different aspect of engineering simulation. And during the webinars, the live webinars, which you will also record, uh, we will really try to give you or to show you what are the most important fundamentals, talk a little bit about the theory, and also about some hands-on stuff. And afterwards, you have one week time to work on an optional homework assignment. You don't have to do the homework assignment, but if you work on this homework assignment, which is about um, deepening your knowledge by creating simulation on your own, you can qualify for a certification of participation, which, you, for example, can add to your CV, um, etc. And you can share the homework using a form on simscale.com. We will talk about the homework assignment later. I will present the homework assignment to you and then I will also show you in detail how to submit the homework assignment. Finally, uh, a lot of questions are asked again and again. So let's quickly go through our 
frequently asked questions. So first of all, this workshop will be recorded. This means we will record every webinar session and probably tomorrow about lunchtime I will send you a link to the recording. And therefore, or since you can watch it again and again, I would recommend not to start to work on the simulation during our live session, uh, but to use this opportunity uh, really to ask questions. Um, since it's a quite interactive format with this webinar. So you can ask questions all the time. There's a question window uh, in your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And if you just summon your questions, my colleague Krishna, who also joined, will answer them in parallel. Or if the question is interesting for a broader audience, for sure we can also discuss it at the end during the Q&A. Okay, then let's get started and talk about our today's fundamentals. And first of all, I would like to introduce you to the RepRap open source 3D printer. And for this workshop, we will uh, show you different examples uh, based on this RepRap open source 3D printer. So what is RepRap? Uh, as you know, 3D printing was invented, or additive manufacturing was invented uh, more than 40 years ago. But for a long time, only a few number of engineers and companies were able to leverage this technology since it was very, very expensive. And during the last 10 years, a lot of things changed. We had a lot of innovations which really uh, pushed down the cost for getting involved in 3D printing. And one of my, my let's say, favorite um, groups or my uh, favorite trend for 3D printing is open source. And RepRap is a project which was founded, I think, also 10 years ago. And the idea is basically to have a, do -it a cheap do-it-yourself 3D printer, which can mainly reproduce itself. What does it mean? If you take a look at this screen, here we can see a bunch of uh, different RepRap 3D printers. And if you take a look, basically all of them are made mainly of, of metal rods which are connected through this, this, this connectors, which are printed by the device itself. And so if you want to build such a print, you just have to download the, the CAD model, so the 3D printable models, the blueprint, and then some parts you can buy them at a local store, and everything else you can print it yourself. And this gives you the opportunity to build your own 3D printer, which you can customize for, for let's say, less than 300 euro, which is really amazing. And one very important aspect is why we choose RepRap is that um, you cannot only, uh, it's not only very accessible, but you can really start to improve your own printer or customize it. And from our experience, if you really attend this workshop, do the homework assignment, you should be ready for your own journey of 3D printing design, and then you should basically be able to improve the design of one of these printers on your own. During this workshop, we will uh, talk mainly about the Rep, Rep Mendel uh, printer, which you can see here. On the, uh, okay, and now let's take a deeper look at what we call fused deposition molding. And that's the, the 3D printing additive uh, manufacturing technology most of the RepRap printers are using. And as you know, when it comes to additive manufacturing, which is also called a lot of times 3D printing, uh, we have a very, very smart idea. Basically, what we do is that we build material are built apart from scratch by adding small voxels, small parts of material uh, to each other. And for example, if we have a three-dimensional object like this, what we do is first of all uh, slice it, which means we will divide it into uh, slices of equal thickness. And then the printer will build up the three-dimensional model slice by slice. And fused deposition molding is one technology for 3D print, and it's based on a plastic filament which is heated up and extruded through a nozzle. And then you can use this extruded plastic, you know, to go on the path of your of your slice and build up the, the different slices. And therefore you can basically say a fused deposition molding printer is nothing more or less than a robotic arm plus a hot glue gun. And if you want a very, very simple version. And here you can see it. This is a cat model of our printer. And let me see if I have a pointer. Yes. 
Here we can see the extruder. So, um, and here we have some step engines, so we can move uh, the extruder in this direction, in this direction, and we can move it also up and down. And this allows us to build nearly every object we want from scratch directly using the 3D printer. Okay, and today, as I mentioned, we will focus on this extruder, which is one of the main parts of a RepRap 3D printer. And first of all, let's talk about how this extruder is basically working. So if you take a look, you can see like a cut view of such an extruder. And basically, inside this extruder, we have a hole, a channel, which becomes smaller and smaller. Here we have the nozzle. And so let's talk first of all the different components. See, is, let's say the main body of the extruder. And here you can see this ribs. It's a kind of heatsink. Below, which we call B, is a heating block. Inside the heating block, inside this hole, is a resistor, which generates heat. And part A is uh, the so-called nozzle, which is then like uh, pushing out the viscous uh, plastic. And basically what the extruder is doing is inside, as I mentioned, inside this hole, we have a resistor and it's heated up. Then the heat is distributed through this metal uh, uh, main body of the extruder. And the idea is that we get the temperature profile, temperature gradient, which means that we need a temperature around 190 degrees at the knee of the nozzle, which is, and this is very important, not the melting temperature, but the so-called glass temperature of uh, ABS and some other thermal plastics. And what is the difference? Therefore, let's take a look at the right side. For example, if we have frozen water, if we have ice, and you would start to heat it up. What we would see is that the temperature is increasing up to a certain point around zero degree, and then it's, it stays stable at zero degree Celsius until everything, all the ice is melted. And there are also some plastic materials which are behaving like that. In contrast to that, thermoplast uh, materials like ABS, they don't have a fixed uh, melting temperature, but they have a glass temperature point. And the reason why it's called glass temperature or transition temperature is that uh, this kind of uh, uh, plastic basically behaves like glass when you hot, uh, 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 heat it up to this temperature. And it will not melt because melting is something different. But what will happen is it becomes whiskers. I don't want to go into too much detail, but this is related to the uh, chemical structure of the, of, the, of the plastic. But the difference is that if I heat it up until this temperature, it's something viscous, which means it's somewhere between a fluid and a solid. And that makes it very easy uh, than to use it for, for creating the structures. And basically, we need some we need to control it. There we have a, a closed control loop, which means we have a controller. This controller is uh, measuring all the time the temperature in the heat block on the defined position. And then we have a, a resistor. And Every time this controller is checking, like, what is the temperature, and if the temperature is too hot, it will decrease uh, uh, the power on the resistor or the voltage on the resistor, and if it's too low, it will increase it. And this kind of closed-loop uh, 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 control mechanism is used to, to uh, steer the temperature and find the te uh, op uh, op optimal temperature for the extruder. And this is a very important point, because as you can imagine, uh, what we're doing here, we are only measuring at one point the temperature and assuming, but not directly, where we want to measure it. And so this is a kind of guess. I mean, it's for most of the cases, it's accurate enough, but if the, what would be if we could exactly say what is the temperature profile inside this whole extruder looking if we no, all, only know the temperature here. And what can help us here is engineering simulation. But before we start to talk about engineering simulation, I would like to talk with you about heat transfer, which is the main physical phenomena which we're using in this extruder. And I don't want to talk too much about theory, but I think at the end of the day, it's important 
uh, to know at least really some fundamentals. So let's take a look. There are basically three principles or three kinds of, of heat transfer. Let's start with the left side. The left side is what we call conduction. And just imagine you have a block made from metal and on the left side there is, for example, a heat source like a fire. On the right side, there is no heat source, there's just an environment. And as a result, the temperature on the left side is higher than the temperature on the right side. So T1 is larger than T2. And what we will see now is that after a certain time, uh, the temperature will be the same on the left and the right side. And the reason is that everywhere, and it's a very fundamental law of heat transfer, you should keep in mind all the time. Heat can only be transferred from hotter to colder regions. And it's transferred as long as it reaches its equilibrium. And so conduction is basically referring to heat transfer through solids. Then we have convection. Convection is a little bit different. Here, let's just imagine we have a hot plate temperature of T1, which is higher T2, and we have a surrounding fluid with a temperature of, of T2. Again, T1 is higher than T2. And what will happen now? Let's imagine this air is streaming over the surface. What we will see now is that uh, this he heat flux Q is transferred through, and it's very important, through and with the fluid. What does it mean? Just imagine the, if the heat goes to the fluid or goes through the fluid, it will heat up the fluid, which will change, for example, the density. And that will result in, in the air uh, striking up. And the very important point is convection means that you transfer heat with a mass transfer. And that's the most important thing you have to remember. Convection is equal to heat transfer together with mass transfer. And convection is, is also a very important aspect, also something we will talk about, especially in the last session. But there is a third kind of heat transfer mechanism called radiation. And as the name says, it's quite similar to light. Uh, basically, radiation is not very important for this kind of technical applications. But just because we should talk about it, uh, first of all, every body, every independent from its temperature, is emitting heat as radiation. And uh, the, um, in, this, uh, in this case, um, the temperature is corresponding even to the wavelength of, 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 our, of our heat radiation. And this is like the third mechanism, transfer heat through radiation. So we can transfer heat through a solid, which is called conduction. We can transfer heat with a fluid, which is called convection, and we can transfer radiation, uh, we can heat through radiation. And the great thing about radiation, by the way, is you don't need any media at all. Even in the vacuum, there is radiation. And this makes sense because otherwise, it would be very cold on the Earth. Just think about it, we will talk about it in one minute. First of all, let's take a look at three examples. The first example on the left side is a very good example for conduction. Just imagine we have a heat plate with a pot on it. And now this heat plate gets heated up. It's in contact with the pot. Both is made of metal, which is very good for conduction. And then the heat flux will go from the heat plate to the pot. Let's take a look at the second example, which is a hairdryer. The hairdryer is based on convection made. Um here we are like heating up a, a, a wire inside the, the hairdryer and we have also a fan. And this fan is moving, forcing the air to move and therefore the air is like heating up and taking the heat with it out of the hairdryer and we use this heat then to heat our, uh, to dry our hairs. And a good example of radiation is basically the sun. As I mentioned before, uh, radiation is the only kind of heat transfer which also works in the vacuum. And all the, all the energy we get from the sun is transferred through radiation. But there's one very important point. In reality, it's not like that there is only convection or only conduction. And I would say heat transfer, uh, usually in the real world, heat transfer involves all three types of, of heat transfer. So we have convection, conduction, radiation. Uh, this is a very good example. Here we have a pot 
over a fire and there we have radiation from the fire itself which is also heating up the um, the pot inside the pot we have convection because there we have this fluid face the water and the water is moving and, tr and therefore transporting heat and finally we have conduction inside the pot itself and if you take a look back at our examples even here we cannot say it's only conduction if you take a look or convecting if you take a look at this pot for sure main, the main part of the energy is transferred through conduction but there will also be radiation also some convection the same here if you ever looked inside you know in the front of a hairdryer you will see that these wires are really becoming red and this is radiation so what I want to say the challenge for every engineer every time it comes to simulation is to identify the primary mechanisms and simplify your problem because simulating convection conduction and radiation all the time will be a very big problem and if you know take a look back at our heat at the heat transfer inside our extruder the first thing I think we can neglect is the radiation because there will be radiation but because there's radiation everywhere but the influence is so small that we don't need to consider it same with, with convection basically there is convection and the convection is uh, between the heat sink and the surrounding air but uh, if we um, make a major simplification we can say we assume this process to be stationary and then we can instead of simulating the convection itself so the interaction of the extruder with its surrounding air we can just say that there is a defined rate of heat which is transferred away from the um, extruder so what we will focus on mainly is conduction because this is the main phenomena which is uh, transporting the heat from the resistor to the metal parts of the sink and from there to the filament to the plastic we want to uh, use for our 3D printer right and I hope you liked the short introduction and right now I would like to show you how to set up a simulation of extruder yourself and therefore first of all I would suggest let's uh, take a look at something I've prepared so here on my web browser I've already created a project and just to make sure you know it SimScale is a free CAE platform everything I'm doing here I'm doing it in my web browser and that's really great because I'm using really a very old laptop for delivering this workshop and since everything is taking place in the cloud there is no need for, for fast hardware another big advantage is that uh, you will never lose data and finally it's free for for yeah, we have our community plan which gives you access to all features uh, complete uh, without any limitations for free and so let's take a look here what we will do today so this is the cat model the 3d design model of our extruder and let's take a look it's made of several parts so first of all we have this uh, main case with the ribs here we have here this uh, part this guide for the filament Solid 3 is a nut which is connecting everything to and solid 3 is the extruder itself which was already merged as you can see with this uh, holder for, for the resistor and the first thing we have to do is we have to create a mesh what does it mean? I don't want to go too much in detail but um, engineering simulation is, is based on the principle of conservation which means there are equations and these equations are quite old which describe for example how energy momentum and mass is conservated inside uh, or during heat transfer but these equations are very hard to solve and basically these are equations which can't be solved analytically but what we can do is like simplify the problem and what we do in the first step is take our model and divide it into small elements of basic geometrical shapes like tetraeders and hexaeders and then we are able to solve this equation or solve uh, the problem uh, which is then simplified and therefore the first step is to create a mesh 
at the mesh we are telling in the end the, the solver or the, the computer how accurate we want the simulation result to be. So first of all we have to add a mesh operation. And at SimScale we have several mesh operations. For FEA we only have the so-called TAT dominant which is dividing a geometry into small TAT readers. Uh, and TAT dominant means that it's based mainly TATs but you can also use some quadrangular elements. But we'll talk about this later. First of all we have to define the element sizing, how it should happen. And in this case we can use automatic element sizing which means that we just give uh, overall mesh finders and the element size, the size of the triangle is calculated automatically. We will use uh, moderate mesh finders. We will use a first order mesh. The difference between first and second order is that uh, first order you have like lines between the points of this element. Uh, linear interpolations but if you use second order you have uh, interpolation of a second order which means uh, it's more compute uh, 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 you need more effort to compute it but you will have more accuracy with the same number of, of elements. All right and then we will use eight computer processes, eight computing cores to calculate the mesh and before we start to, to calculate the mesh we can also add manual refinements and this is important because how, uh, this automatic meshing is quite good but in the end of the day it's still a computer which don't know what you're interested in and since we're interested in the heat transfer between several parts and the most of the change is happening in the interface between the different parts we want to have a higher resolution there to get a higher accuracy so let's call it contact refinement because we want to apply it between the contacts then we will choose local element size and manual so now we can really give manually the exact element size we want to be there course is fine for the mesh grading this is like uh, how the mesh will grow between maximum and minimum element size. We will not allow uh, quadrangular elements and now we have to add it to the parts. So let's start. Everywhere we have interface for example if you take a look at let's start here with uh, solid zero which is this um, heatsink and we can change uh, to surface which makes it easier to and there we have here a contact and here add selection from wheel and now it's added next part is this one and here we have a contact like here two other parts and here Now let's take a look at the next solid, at the nut. Here we have some, here we have here contact, here, here contact, here contact. Great. And finally we have this heat block and there we have here a contact we have here a contact Now we can add this to the view and now this is done and we can start the meshing. And this meshing can take some minutes and therefore 
I have prepared something for you. This project where I the mesh is already existing. Take some time until it's load. Maybe I can answer some question in the meantime. Let me take a look. Okay, there is a first question by Pramod. Uh, I think I, I know you, Pramod. You joined uh, some some webinars in the past, right? And he wants to know which method is used in solving the equations in SimScale: FEM, FEM, or FDM. Uh, just for those of you who are not so familiar with simulation, uh, this this uh, uh, sh uh, sh terms FEM, FEM, FDM are uh, uh, relating to the mathematic approach you use to solve these equations. And at SimScale we have FEM, which is finite element method, which we use for structural mechanics, and we have FVM, finite volume method, which we use for fluid dynamic simulations. Huge Miller wants to know why did you highlight only the interfaces between the parts and the and excludes the interface between the part and the material? A very good question. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you, um, simulation is about simplifying. Sim and the best simulation is as simple as possible, but accurate enough to solve your problem. And as an engineer. <laughs> who worked a lot of times with, with uh, melting and extruders, I know that um, the heat transfer between the filament and the extruder can be neglected since it's very small. And therefore we decided not to simulate, we are not simulating what the filament is doing, we are only simulating uh, what is happening inside the extruder. And at a later step, right now, we will add the boundary condition which will like simulate how the heat is transferred away from the extruder itself. I hope that answered your question, Jude. If not, ask again after the live demo. I think some things will become more clear. And Bala Kumaran wants to know what file format does we support? A very good question. So there are two ways to import a geometry. First of all, you can upload a geometry um, using different file formats. Right now we support step. I just be rep STL bot. In some weeks, we will use our new uh, geometry, uh, geometrical backend, and then you can even upload native CAD system files like CATIA files, SolidWorks files, Solid Edge files, and so on. However, I have just prepared a mesh with exactly the same settings, and this is how the mesh will look like once it's finished. You can see right now it's loading, so all the results are transferred from the cloud back. And this is the mesh. And as you can see, for example, everywhere where the interface, for example, let's remove here everything. Then you can see like that the mesh was automatically refined here or here according to our refinement we added. Um, and, and that's very important. What will happen during the simulation is that the computer will only calculate for every element uh, or uh, temperature and other quantities. So the density of this mesh is related to the accuracy of your simulation. And that's very important to know. If you want to take a look inside your mesh, you can use our filter our mesh filters and we can apply a so-called mesh clip. Just click on apply. And now we can take a look inside the mesh. We can even align it to the x-axis. And now you can really see the structure of this mesh. 
great. Now let's start to set up the simulation itself. And therefore, we will create a new simulation. We will use a thermostructural analysis, heat transfer advanced, and we will do it steady state, and we will not do a nonlinear analysis. All right, first of all, we have to choose the mesh we want to simulate. So I click on this mesh, click on save, and then the mesh will be added to our simulation. That's a great thing, by the way, about SimScale's user interface. You basically just have to go from this tab to the middle tab to the right tab, and you have the simulation tree, the navigator tree, and you just have to go through this tree, and once everything is green and blue, you're ready to start your simulation. Okay, and as you know, this model is made of four different parts. And first of all, we have somehow to explain the computer how these parts are interacting, and therefore we have to define what is called contacts. And let's start. It's in all at all we need three contacts, because we have four parts. The number of contacts you need at least is the number of parts minus one. It can be more, but at least you need so many contacts. And the first contact we will define is between the heat nozzle block and the nut connector. So let's call it heater nozzle lock to nut. It's a bonded contact. And here we have to define the tolerance. And this tolerance is a value for the connection of the interface node to the corresponding master face. So the idea is that one part is the master, one part is the safe, slave, and the slave is following the master. And as long as it's inside the tolerance, it will follow it, and if it's outside, the connection will be ignored. And this value is quite large. And since all the part is very small, we will also use a much smaller tolerance. And next step is to define the master and slave entities. And let's start with the nozzle block. I will change the view to surface, which makes some things easier. And this is our nozzle block, right? And here to the nut we have basically two master faces, this one and this one. And now if you take out the lot nut, the corresponding faces are this one and that one, right? And these are added as slave entities. Right, and that's our first contact. It's done. We have to add two additional contacts. One contact between the nozzle, uh, the insulator, and the plastic part. So this um, guide for, for uh, the filament. So let's call it nozzle to guide to insulator. It's again a bounded contact. We use the same tolerance. And here we will start with that part. And this part. Okay. And first of all, take a look here. We have this part, and we have this part, which is our master. And then, if we hide them again and take a look at this main body, here again we have here and here the corresponding faces. And now we can add 
our final contact which we need which is connecting the guide to the nozzle Again, we will use a different tolerance, and this one is this one is here. That's the master. The corresponding faces here. which is a slave. Now that's done and we can continue and define the materials we want to use. And for the materials the great thing is now we have to define for every volume our material and let's start um, I would suggest let's start with this volume 3 which is wait I have to change my selection mode which is um, the extruder, and the extruder is made of aluminium, and so we can just go to material library, choose the aluminium, click on save, and add it to the part. We can also do it graphically, but also change, choose it from the list. Click on save. The Next part is the nut, which is made of steel. So let's again use the material library. Steel. Add it. To the nut. By the way, does anybody have an idea why we're using steel for the nut and aluminium for the nozzle itself? Any ideas? Just write it into the chat or the question box. Okay, I think you know it, but you're shy. Basically, for sure, uh, yes, exactly, Omar. Aluminium is much more conductive and uh, that's the reason why I use aluminium for my it's also right, the right answer. Great guys, then let's continue and finish our simulation setup. We are nearly on the final straight, so then we have to create now two custom materials which are not part of our library. First of all, for PTFE, which you also know as Teflon maybe, which is used for the guide. And here we just add the density, which we know. I just look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> and then we have to add the conductivity, which is 0 0.25 watt per meter Kelvin, and the specific heat capacity, which is around 1000. And finally, we will assign it to the, this guide. And finally what is missing is the heatsink itself. And here we'll use PEK. I again googled for the material properties. It's much more conductive uh, than, than uh, the PTFE. And finally, I have just to select OK. Well, and now we have nearly done, and now we can add our so called boundary conditions, which describe the interaction between our model 
and its environment. Right, then let's start. And first of all, we have uh, two kind of boundary conditions. First of all, here we have oh, sorry, one we have not a temperature load but a heat flux load, which is a difference. Uh, I have to delete it. And now. First of all, we will add this convective heat flux. And this is like used to model the heat which is going through the environment of the printer. And therefore, we have to select all outer faces. And the best trick for that is just to select those faces where you don't want to apply the boundary condition. And then for the other faces, you can just leave it like it is. We have to change the selection mode to faces. I will select this one. And now invert my selection. I can add this boundary condition to everything else. We just modify it a little bit and 10 the right convective coefficient for air. And then you will add the second boundary condition uh, of the of the resistor of the heat which is brought inside the system. And there we use source heat flux, a source heat flux of 4023.8 which we calculated based on the resistor and then we just apply it to this phase. And now we are done. That's it. We can start our simulation finally. We just, this setting is fine. We just go on check simulation and everything is successful and so now we can create a new simulation and start it. Now let's do a quick wrap up before we take a look at the simulation results. Um, yes. I think I talked generally about the process of FEA of simulation, but first of all we had this pre-processing where we divided the geometry into a mesh, then we set it up the simulation, now we'll do the post-processing. So um, I think the mesh Generation was quite simple. I showed you how to create a TED dominant mesh and add mesh refinement. The simulation setup was more interesting. So first of all, we had to choose the general setups, general physics we want to simulate, in our case, heat transfer. Then we had to assign a mesh, define the context to describe how the interactions between the parts, define the materials, the boundary conditions, and then start the simulation. And since the simulation will run for, for some time, I think 20 minutes, I have again prepared something. So don't worry, here we have a project which is including the results also. So let's open this project and take a look inside. Uh, in the meantime, maybe I can again try to answer some of your questions. Uh, wait just one second. Yes, Cash, uh, just because some people ask who joined later, yes, we will provide you with the recording of this webinar, so you don't have to worry. Okay, if you have other questions, guys, just write them down and I will try to answer them uh, all as quick as possible. Since, uh, I don't know, I think I have to, no, it's loading, sorry. All right. Just just a question of seconds, guys. You have to be patient, sorry. Okay, now it's here. And don't forget, everything we do, we're doing it here in the web browser. Um, Omar wants to know, are we uploading assembly or single part? In this case, we uploaded assembly made of four solids, but you can also upload single parts or much more complex assemblies. Okay, now let's take, first of all, switch to the simulation designer.
and then we can take a look at the results. So this is simulation and if you click on the simulation one you can see like it took 12 minutes, it was successful. And um, once the simulation is finished, you can also take, a, if you want, uh, take a uh, look at the log file. If you click here, it will open in the 3D window. But this is not giving us a lot of information. So let's switch to the post processor and try to analyze the results. And the first thing um, we want to do is to take a look at the so-called solution fields and you just have to keep in mind simulation result is nothing more or less than a vector or a scalar field for temperature for the whole part, for the whole uh, assembly. Okay, it's a question by Florian Rudinger. Why can the heat transfer to the filament be neglected? While the contact area may be small, it to me seems like the melting material is the most important uh, heat sink in the system. Yes, the reason is, uh, Florian, for sure this is a simplification. And we could also add, if we want, um, the filament, which would make simulation much more complex. But uh, the reason can be found in the slide I showed you before here. And as you see, uh, the, the materials we are using, uh, uh, they have this glass temperature. They are not melting. And if you take a look, um, the temperature is not changing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's changing. Uh, during uh, during the seating process in contrast to, to materials like metal or water where the temperature is staying constant. And therefore if you just calculate yourself uh, you will see that uh, just take a pencil and like uh, you have this amount of heat and you need this amount of heat to uh, heat it up that if you basically know the temperature distribution uh, inside the guiding channel this should be enough of information to, to tune the parameters uh, for your um, extruder. But Florian, uh, we are here to learn and what we also want to achieve is to have a discussion between the participants of this workshop. So um, if you're interested, join our forum, my colleagues will help you and for sure we can also try to set up a simulation which is including the effect of um, the, the uh, filament. But since the filament is moving, this is, uh, you have to do a transient which will uh, uh, Yes, be a pain in the ass, to be honest. <laughs> Wait, let's take a look at the results first. So the results are loaded, now we can take a look at the three-dimensional results. And here you can see, for example, the temperature distribution. Uh, I used a very low, low heat flux, so the temperature is quite low right now, but if we use a higher heat flux, I will show you some results later, um, you can also reach realistic temperatures. And for example, you can add now a clip filter, which means we are cutting through the whole simulation. Exactly like this. And now, we can take a look, for example, at the heat distribution inside this part. And I have prepared for you, um, we will describe this post-processing more in detail in the tutorial, but I have prepared for you for sure something um, here. And what I did is this, I used the same boundary condition, so we had the same uh, heat boundary condition for the resistor, and I just changed like the shape of this cooling ribs. And here you can see the temperature distribution. And it's obvious that it's a very big impact. So having this thicker, uh, this much thicker ribs will take a lot of the heat outside. And now if you take a look uh, at the left side here, I've extracted the temperature profile. So uh, what we did here is like we plotted how the temperature is changing. Sorry, I have to change my pencil in this direction. So this is uh, 
this is A, this is B. And we can use this, use this results, for example, to optimize the topology of um, the heat sinks in order to have the best heat distribution we need. Because you should not forget, until we reach this glass temperature, nothing will happen. And until we, and when we reach this glass temperature, it will start to become viscous. So um, you can really like then uh, manipulate this temperature profile by changing um, the design of the heat sinks itself. And now I think we should talk about your homework assignment because I showed you a lot of things, but you know the best way to learn something is to do it on your own. Um, and what I would suggest, uh, and your homework this week will be to create yourself a simulation for at least two different exterior designs and compare the results. And the good thing is we'll provide you with everything you need. So we have a partner company on Shape, which is also a free online CAD tool. And there we have prepared for you a parametric CAD model of the extruder. Let me show you what this means. Um, here's the model. And on Onshape you can register for free. It's a CAD tool, and this model we will provide you with a link. And for example, you can just you have this uh, six variables you can change. And for example, um, if you just want to change the diameter of the inner cylinder, you can just change it, for example, to zero point zero zero four. And then this CAD model. Will update automatically, and this gives you to change with just one or two clicks to generate as much as designs as you want. And the great thing is, you can once you have modified your geometry, you just go on some scale, then you go on geometries, and instead of upload, you go on import, then you log in with your Onshape account. You can just create a free account. And then you can directly import the geometry from Onshape to SimScale. I see there are some questions. No, okay. Maybe take some time for the, if you do the first time. And now I can go on extruder parametrics. This was the model. and just import it. And this can take now one minute or two, but that's it. And this is the way uh, you can yourself start to play around with simulation and improve and explore the extruder design. Oh, see, now it's imported again with all three solids. Okay, then you will find um, on our webpage simscale.com 3D printing workshop from tomorrow on you will find um, a lot of resources. So we'll provide you with a step-by-step -step tutorial for how to manipulate the geometry, how to create the simulation. Uh, with a recording and some other help. And if you need help, we have our SimScale forum, which you will find on forum.simscale.com. Uh, and in this forum, we already made the tutorial available. And we will send you tomorrow a link to this forum, and there you can like read the uh, tutorial. And if you have questions, directly reach out to one of uh, my colleagues. And we will provide as much support as we can through our forum. So you just go on categories, and there's this do-it-yourself 3D printer workshop here. And for example, there is this tutorial. It's not available, public available right now, but from tomorrow on it will be. And here every step is described, like how to modify the CAD model, how to create the mesh, and how to analyze the result. 
you have one week time for this um, assignment and after uh, uh, and you can uh, share this um, homework with us using a form link a form I will send to you by email tomorrow and now I think uh, yes it's time for our Q&A session I think we answered a lot of questions already but if there are some more questions uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see okay Abhishek Sony uh, that's a great question. Can we do a shape optimization of the exterior based on the thermal modeling to check the best shape? Yes, uh, for sure you can do that and this is something I really suggest. The best way to learn simulation or to learn engineering is to do it. And simulation gives you a great opportunity that you can test everything in a virtual environment which you want to test. Great. But it seems that there are no questions anymore since Krishna answered all of them directly once they were asked. I just can say thank you for being here with us. In the case you have a question, you can also reach out to us using the forum. It was great. I hope to see you all next week. Uh, yes, uh, just because last question, Miles one. So the models will be available on simscale.com slash reprinting slash workshop. Uh, uh, yes, it will be available there on the website where you also registered for the workshop. But tomorrow I will send you all the information by email. Okay, guys, hope to see you next week. Uh, have a nice day and see you soon. Bye. And don't forget to do the homework, right? <laughs> Bye.